Hello friends, in one of our videos on the Russian channel we tested 5 SATA SSD drives from China and got quite interesting results. People in the comment section suggested us to also test NVMe drives. Ok then, the test subjects have finally arrived from China. This time we picked up more capacious 512GB drives. Here we have the best-selling M.2 NVMe SSDs on AliExpress. Kingspec, Goldenfur, Clisser, Nitak and i300. Also, I picked up the cheapest NVMe SSD I could find in a local store, it is called Patriot P300. And we also got an SSD from MSI. I know, this is not an ad, this is the only manufacturer who just sent us their SSD for a test. It's more expensive and we will see how it performs. And somehow it seems to me that it will not perform much better than the rest. You can see the prices for all the SSDs on your screen right now. Basically, they are all more or less the same, give or take, up to 50 US dollars. Except for MSI Spatium and of course Samsung. Because it is a 2TB premium drive that we use for reference. Let's see how such SSDs perform in a long distance race, how much they heat up, whether they need heat sinks, how they behave when felt, and of course, take a look at their insights. We will also test a couple of PCIe adapters for M.2 from China. This is MK. Today we'll conduct a full-fledged test of popular Chinese NVMe solid-state drives. Here is some basic info on PCIe to NVMe adapters. These standards are very similar. The adapters are very cheap on AliExpress, you might need them if you have run out of M.2 slots on your motherboard. First, remember about the keys. The M.2 slot can have two of them, and they determine which type of drive can be inserted into them – SATA, NVMe or either. Second, NVMe works through four PCI Express lanes. Therefore, basic adapters with one lane will cut down the performance by a lot. Thus, the top-end Samsung 980 Pro connected via one lane performed at 800 megabytes per second for both reading and writing. This is very close to the SATA standard, whereas the real performance of this drive is about 6 gigabytes per second via PCIe 4.0 and more than 3 gigabytes per second with PCIe 3.0. Therefore, look for the adapters with 4 or 16 lanes. The latter will still have only 4 logical PCIe's, so there will be no real difference between them. As you can see, they do not cut down the performance compared to the M.2 slots on the board, since both, in fact, work through the same PCIe lanes connected to the processor or chipset. It is also worth remembering that for ordinary PCs, the number of PCIe lanes is limited to a couple of dozen, and if you connect both a graphics card and a couple of drives, there's a chance that the actual operating speeds will be lower than they should be. In our test, we had to pull out the graphics card and use onboard graphics. Moving on, what is the main downside of a fast SSD? It is heating. In order to process data at the rate of a couple of gigabytes per second, fast controllers are needed, which are prone to heating a lot. But is it critical? Well, let's check it out. And let's start with Samsung. If you constantly record data on it at a maximum speed in the ADA64 test with large data chunks, then after a few minutes you will see the saw teeth on the graph, and the time it took to record 2 terabytes reached 32 minutes. According to our pyrometer, the controller has heated up to 80 degrees Celsius, and Smart Utility reports a high temperature after the test. Now let's equip it with a simple heat sink from AliExpress without a heat pipe. A very cheap one, in fact just a bar of aluminum. And the situation changes drastically. The graph becomes smoother and there are no peaks and the recording time has decreased by 20% to 26 minutes. Judging by the built-in sensor, the drive heated up significantly less, to 63 degrees. Let's check if a more advanced heatsink with a heat pipe by Snowman will change the situation. No, we see the same 26 minutes and a smooth graph. So, if you have a top-end hot NVMe SSD, it does need a heatsink, but not necessarily an advanced one. But what about those basic Chinese drives? Do they need it? All of our six subjects could not reach the temperatures above 68 degrees, even in the ADA64 Extreme test. On average, they heated up to 50 or 55 degrees. At the same time, the test showed the absence of thermal throttling, although a different problem turned up. All the cheap drives showed incorrect temperatures in smart, 40 or 42 degrees, which never changed. Only the more expensive MSI drive has a working thermal sensor. But this is not particularly important. It is not to hide thermal throttling anyway. The real temperatures are too low for that. And in real workload, the temperatures will be even lower. And therefore, there is no point in wasting money on a heat sink in the case of inexpensive NVMe SSDs. In the review section on AliExpress, there are many comments that say that they do buy heat sinks for them, which I believe is rather excessive. Now let's move on to the tests. 
To begin with, here's the data from Crystal Disk Info. Everything seems to be normal. All SSDs except MSI are formally new and have never been turned on before. Although it is worth mentioning that any drive's mileage can be zeroed out, so to say. Now let's look at the controllers and memory chips. All of our SSDs don't have a DRAM buffer, which is of course a huge downside. However, they are using the technology called HMB, which uses your system's RAM as a buffer, which is supposed to help, but of course it doesn't. Quality NVMe drives of such volumes have DRAM chip of 512 megabytes. HMB uses 16 to 64 megabytes of your computer's RAM, which is extremely little, and the computer memory is physically far away. As a result, expecting high performance from such drives is a no-go. But of course not the buffer alone is responsible for this. As for the controllers, Clisser, Patriot and Goldenfur are based on the good old SM2263 XT controller from 2017. At that time it was not bad at all. But the question is, where are they getting it from today? The controller itself has 4 channels and in the case of a 500GB SSD, all of them are occupied. That is, we see the maximum possible performance, which means that the 1TB version will not be any faster. As for the memory chips, here's where things are getting interesting. Clisser comes with a 96 layer SAN disk. Golden Fur is even worse, a 64 layer Micron. Both of these chips are obsolete. They are 4 or 5 years old. But at least this is TLC, and not a more recent but slow and less reliable QLC. Patriot turned out to be a surprise though. A fairly recent 128 layer Hynix chip gives it a chance to win the race. Moving on, the next in line are Kingspec and Neetac, equipped with the Maxio MAP1202 controller. This is a purely Chinese piece of tech from the late 2020, which similarly has 4 channels and is faster than the above solution by Silicon Motion. With the memory chips, everything is more interesting. While Neetac is equipped with a not so old 112 layer Sandisk chip, in the case of Kingspec, the diagnostic utility just froze trying to determine what it is. One of the chips is okay, it is a 128 layer YMTC chip, but apparently there are problems with the other one. Given that this is a young Chinese manufacturer, we may have come across a defected or bent chip. A little spoiler, the test of this particular SSD were most excruciating. And finally, the most expensive drive in our collection, MSI. And as expected, it looks fairly decent for its price. Comes with the Fison E15 controller, which is essentially a top-end E19, except with disabled PCIe 4.0 support. Working in tandem with it is the new 176-layer Micron memory with four channels. And here we can draw intermediate conclusions that low prices come at a cost. These Chinese SSDs are so cheap not because premium brands set high prices to get a bigger margin, but because these Asian shops operating in some basements are using cheap or obsolete controllers and memory chips. Well, let's run some tests and see how they perform. These are the performance results for our SSDs showed in Crystal Disk Mark. Although it is more demonstrative, we will draw our conclusions using another benchmark that gives more detailed information. We're running Atto benchmark on empty drives to see peak performance of each of them. And here, unlike with SATA, the spread is much more significant. When testing SATA, we almost always ran into the bus limits and the max performance varied little, 450 to 550 megabytes per second. Here only NEDAC and MSI got somewhat close to the theoretical limits of 4 lanes of PCIe 3.0. We got 3.5 gigabytes per second and that only in read mode. Kinspec showed the worst result here, 800 megabytes per second, a little more than the limitations of SATA. On average, the cheap drives showed about 1.5 to 2 GB per second. The difference with SATA drive is quite noticeable, it would seem, but as you may have guessed, there are nuances. To determine those nuances, let's run a large data chunks test in ADA64. Yes, it's still synthetic, it's hard to imagine someone writing 500 gigabytes of data at a time, but this test is indicative of how the controller handles data packing and its maximum performance in continuous workload. And the results turned out to be extremely interesting. Firstly, the general principle of operation of all tested bufferless NVMe SSDs is similar to the SATA SSDs, but differs in one important detail. More on that later. Secondly, in some cases SATA drives turned out to be even faster. Let's try to figure out why. All the drives start off quite well and write down about 15-25% to of the volume quite fast. NeTag and MSI are in the lead, 2 GB per second. And this is understandable, these solutions have newer controllers and the memory chips used in them are not complete junk either. Clisser, Patriot and Goldenfur stick together, showing about 1300 to 1500 megabytes per second. That is caused by the albeit good but still obsolete controller and memory chips. 
But after continuous recording of about 100 gigabytes of data, a steep drop-down happens. The leader does not change. The MSI drive yields 850 megabytes per second. The outsider doesn't change either. Kingspec is at the bottom with 60 megabytes per second. The rest are around 250 to 300 megabytes per second. And this behavior is close to what we saw in the SAT SSD test, and the reason for this is simple. SLC caching. The principle is simple. Modern memory chips are based on triple-level cells or quad-level cells, or TLC and QLC, which allows for a more efficient data storage. You can store three or four bits of information in one cell rather than just one bit. However, writing data in three or four bit mode is quite slow. Therefore, manufacturers of SSD controllers made a trick. Initially, the data is written in fast single bit mode for as long as possible into the so-called single level cell cache or SLC. In this mode, the drive can easily reach the performance of several gigabytes per second, which we can see in various benchmarks such as Crystal Disk Mark, AS SSD or Addo, and at the beginning of the ADA64 test. But the problem is that in this mode, the volume of the drive drops three or four times. That is, for a 500 gigabyte drive, you'll have like 100 or 150 gigabytes, which can be written at such high speeds. And what happens when the storage space runs out in single bit mode, but you still need to keep writing the data down onto that drive? That's right, the controller has to pack the data recorded into single bit cells and rearrange it into TLC and QLC, while simultaneously fill in the freed cells with new data that's still coming in. This task is challenging even for top-end controllers. Therefore, the performance drops down significantly and stays that way until the very end of the real drive volume. And this is exactly what we saw in the SAT SSD test. But in the case of NVMe, everything is more interesting. Since all the test subjects come with TLC memory, it would make sense if the maximum write speed maintains up to a third of the drive volume. However, all of them drop the speed much earlier, at about 20% of the volume. Here we can see how the smart NVMe controllers are trying to soften the blow that's to come. If they have free cells in stock, maintaining reasonable speed in TLC mode is possible for some time, that is, until you finally have to get to squeezing that SLC cache. And only when the drive runs out of this extra stock of cells, we see a second drop in performance, which is extremely huge. The controller has to squeeze the single bit cache and write down in TLC mode only at the second third of the volume, which causes this catastrophic drop down that SAT SSDs had on one third. This approach makes a lot of sense in the long run. A good analogy here is runners. It is more profitable not to run out of breath at the very beginning, but to start slowly, save your breath and eventually get a higher average speed. But in our case, the runners are obviously not of the world class. The first dropdown made them as slow as the cheapest SAT SSDs are, and the second basically turned them into classic hard drives. But there are two exceptions. These are Kingspec, which took as much as two hours to record 500 gigabytes at a speed of 60 megabytes per second, and MSI, the first dropdown for which was the least, and in the second, it was clearly seen that the controller still manages to pack the SLC cells on time. Synthetic benchmarks only confirmed our theoretical conclusions. SSDs have made a lot of progress in recent years, and if a good five-year-old processor is still able to run almost everything without issues, a 5-year-old SSD controller is not a good pick. Actually, most likely this is exactly why they're sold so cheaply in China, along with old memory chips and thus make their way into small local manufacturers of solid-state drives. Synthetic tests are of course interesting, but in practice, hardly anyone would record 500 gigabytes at once. Let's take a look at a more realistic work scenario when such a drive is filled somewhere by half, say about 300 gigabytes, and you want to throw in 100 gigabytes more, for example, an Adobe Premiere project or a AAA game. We will copy that much data from a 2 terabyte Samsung 980 Pro drive, in order to make sure that this is not a bottleneck. Half of the SSD volume is already filled, which means that we have 50 gigabytes at most for the SLC cache. And this is clearly seen in practice in the case of Clisser, Patriot and NeedTag. They wrote down some part of the volume into SLC cache at a good speed of 1.5 gigabytes per second, and then altogether they drop to 200 megabytes per second. If you're downloading a modern video game, you'll hardly notice this difference, even if your connection is extremely fast. But if you plan to work, for example, with 4K footages on a regular basis, then such performance is only slightly better than that of regular HDDs, which can hardly be called adequate. Especially considering that NeedTech hit more than 3 gigabytes per second at the beginning. Now let's talk a bit more about the ones standing out. These are Goldenfur, MSI and Kingspec. 
The leader was already obvious. The MSI drive maintained more than 800 megabytes per second until very end, even when copying a 100 gigabyte file. MSI, as well as Golden Fur, uses a dynamic SLC cache. In other words, the controller controls the volume depending on the free space. In theory, in the case of quality SSDs, this allows for a better long-run performance at a cost of the drop-down that comes faster. This is exactly the case with MSI, but not with Golden Fur. The 150 megabytes that it hits is adequate for a cheap SATA solution, but not for NVMe. Kingspec, which is my favorite now, as usual showed the worst results imaginable. 2.2 megabytes per second, that is its final performance. It tried very hard and sometimes it even managed to get back to 60 megabytes per second. And in this case, it is not the controller's fault. Neatag has a similar controller and works much better. Apparently, the YMTC memory chips, in this case, is what was left after binning. It is quite obvious that if you use such a drive as a system drive, a drop down to 2 megabytes per second will at best cause your operating system to work slowly and at worst to a blue screen of death. At the end, we will once again run tests in auto on drives filled by 400 gigabytes, which is 80%. And here again, no surprises. There's practically no difference with empty ones. That is, except for Kingspec. And this is expected. All popular benchmarks usually write down not more than a couple of gigabytes, which always fit into the SLC cache. Given the fact that Windows behaves the same way, even with drives that are fairly full, there will be no performance issues. Well, with the exception of Kingspec, of course, which even at 80% of the volume filled, managed to drop down to 150 megabytes per second with large files and to 20 megabytes with small ones. And I think it is not necessary to explain that this will lead to a serious slowdown of your system at any attempt to record just anything. So what's the conclusion? A miracle did not happen. Saving a bug by picking up a cheap Chinese SSD on AliExpress is not a wise decision. All of those drives are made according to a simple principle. Cut all the corners possible. As a result, in the best case scenario, we will have relatively new base level controllers, but for the most part, solutions from five years ago with obsolete memory chips and with a minimum of diversity. There were only two types of controllers in the four SSDs tested. This is the main problem that is clearly visible in the case of Kingspec. Even on the official poster, the company shows that the performance may vary by three times, which clearly indicates a lottery in the components used, and the manufacturer clearly doesn't bother to test the result in Frankensteins. As a result, you may well receive a drive that will record data slower than the cheapest USB stick. And this applies not only to Kingspec. As I said above, all no-name drives from China are similar, so you can expect floppy drive performance in NeTag as well as Golden Fur, and in general in any cheap SSD. And this is not the worst. Here's a question for you. Where do they get these old memory chips and controllers? Best case scenario, they buy up leftovers from manufacturers that need to get rid of obsolete components that no self-respecting brand will ever use anymore. In the worst case, demonstration samples or rejected chips as in Kingspec. That is, they are sold as rejected silicon wafers that have not passed all necessary tests, but some of the NAND chips on them are possibly still operable. Small companies are happy to cut them into chips, test them somehow, package them and sell them cheaply to local SSD makers. As a result, you may well come across a drive that has one good memory chip and one not very good, with deplorable performance and a great chance to lose your data. And this is not an assumption. Go ahead and scroll through the reviews on Kingspec and Golden Fur. A serious performance variation is clearly noticeable, and there are also complaints that the drive does not work out of the box or that Windows stopped loading on it after a while. While buying CPUs from AliExpress is indeed a good option, these processors are definitely not counterfeit and sometimes are twice as cheap as in the local retail, this is not the case for SSDs. And it would make sense if similar solutions in local stores cost twice as much, but no, the Patriot drive that we picked up at a local store costs about $3 more, offering the same old controller but new memory chips, and the chance of that loss is significantly lower here. And most importantly, it comes with a one-year warranty from the retailer. Anyway, here's the rating of the SSDs tested in this video. Among those that I ordered from China, Clisser turned out to be the best. It did not disappoint in the test with large data chunks and maintain high speed in copying without dropping below 250 megabytes per second. Does it make sense to risk your nerves and data in order to save 5 bucks? I suggest you answer this question in the comments. In the description you will not see the links for the SSDs tested. We wouldn't want you to buy such garbage. This was MK, my name is Mikhail Kroshin, I'm waiting for you in the comments. Bye.